Well, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, I will finish 1 Corinthians 12 today. How about that? It'll be something on it. Um, taking us a while. And we're studying this list that Paul made. This is his second list in the book of, in 1 Corinthians 12. He's given one list earlier in chapter, uh, verses 8 through 11. Now he's given us this list, start in verse 28. And so I already preached some of those last week, and I'm just going to get into it and keep going from here. Verse 28 through 31. In the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. So I mentioned this last time. Paul has listed these gifts here in these verses in terms of uh, importance. He, like there's levels of gifts, important gifts. Now I had said earlier, there, there's no greater gift and no lesser gift. All the gifts are needed. All, we need each other's gifts. There's no one that can boast about how good their gift is and put someone else down. And there's no one who has a, a lesser gift who can feel bad about it and feel uh, ashamed of their gift like they wish they had a better one than that. None of that exists. And yet here Paul makes this list where he says, first of all, you have apostles. They're ranked in, they're ranked in importance. God has appointed these gifts to the church and placed them how he wanted them to be, set them up, laid them out, assigned a duty, at least in terms of foundational um, building up of the church, the foundational contribution that would establish the church and sustain the church. That's what these gifts are. They have sustained the church. They established it and sustained it. And the first one of those is a unique gift, the apostle. And this was especially designed to establish the church, especially designed to build up a foundational structure and the gospel doctrine of the church. The apostles were men that were chosen by Christ and sent by Jesus Christ with a special calling from him directly to go out. These were the apostles. And once they died, once the last apostle died, which was John, this gift ceased. There are no more apostles. There are no apostles in the world anywhere. There are people who claim they are, but they're false. This gift ceased. Now, secondly, and we look at this last week too, in importance is prophets. Prophets were those men who spoke directly from God, revelation straight from God and for God to the local church. They gave the message that God wanted them to give. He directed them to proclaim this message, and that's what they did. These were the prophets. And they basically pro proclaimed the same message that the apostles preached and the apostles taught, that what we have now in the New Testament, is, which is what the New Testament prophet proclaimed in the local church, but they didn't have the New Testament then. So when the New Testament was written, and that era of the apostolic era ended, the, the prophets ended. There are no prophets. There are people out there who claim to be prophets, but they're not. In fact, they prophesy all kinds of things that are false. So they're, they don't come true. They're false prophets. So that's, that gift ceased as well. Third we looked at last time is the gift of teacher. This is basically someone who has the ability to teach what's already been revealed to the people in, in a clear and effective way. A uh, teacher has a special ability to explain clearly the things of God in such a way that people understand. People are clearly taught what God, what God says and they know what he's saying. A teacher does that. That's a gift. And they can profit from that teaching. Well, that's what we looked at last time, those three gifts. Those are the main three gifts Paul lists. He says first, second, third. So then he says, some more gifts. He doesn't give them a number category, but he says, then you have these other gifts. And he lists some gifts that uh, we looked at a few weeks ago, at least these first two. There are three gifts that I'm going to briefly go over them, and then I'll uh, spend some more time in two of the gifts that are there that we haven't looked at yet before. So it says in verse 28, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing. Well, literally, it doesn't say workers of miracles. It just says, then miracles, or then powers. 
Now, we did study this a few weeks ago when we were in verse 10. This is the gift of, of God giving someone the ability to do things that defy natural law. They would blow your mind, your, your jaw would be open, and you'd be gasping with awe, like, what is going on here? Things that are mind-blowing. You drop your jaw, and Jesus did things like this, made water out of wine. How do you, I mean, I made wine out of water. That's what I meant to say. H2O gets in, turned into this multiple uh, compound. Miraculous. Jesus cast out demons. Jesus calmed a storm. I mean, there was a, a raging storm, and Jesus went, shh, and the storm stopped. That's a miracle. Jesus raised people from the dead. That's a miracle. This is what that gift is. People who have the gift to do things that defy natural law. There is no way to explain it except that it's miraculous. We looked at that a couple of weeks, three weeks ago. Also in here, Paul says, gifts of healing. We looked at that when we were in verse 8. This is someone who has, uh, by the Spirit of God, a spiritual gift to miraculously make people who are sick with all kinds of diseases, all kinds of ailments, all kinds of sickness. Someone who has the gift of, a gift of healing can make someone who's sick well again, perfectly healthy. That's what the gift is. Now, maybe there's someone out there, there are people who claim they do these things all the time, but nobody does the things like Jesus did. I mean, someone who has cancer and they've lost a hundred pounds and they're about to die next week and then someone with the gift of healing would come up and heal them and they would be perfectly well and within an hour they would gain 50, that pound, 50 pounds back and be up dancing around. That's healing. People don't do that anymore. They claim that they heal, but it's all head game stuff. All the quadriplegics and all the paraplegics go to the healing crusade, still go home, quadriplegic and paraplegic. They're not healed. Jesus healed them all the time. Someone who had the gift of healing could do that. So I believe, and I've said this before, uh, that since those gifts aren't around, they ceased. Mir miracles and healings ceased. Not saying God can't do a miracle or God won't do a miracle or God can't heal or won't heal or doesn't heal. It's just not a gift exercised in the church with someone in each local church having that gift to go heal people. I preach that and we'll preach it again. So, but the point is, with this whole verse, even as awesome as these gifts are, even as awesome as healing and as awesome as miracles are, they rank below the gift of apostle. They rank below the gift of prophet. They rank below the gift of teaching. That's why, that's why he labels it this way. First, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracle workers, then healers. That's what Paul's saying. And then he names two gifts that are not in his previous list, list and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on those today. Uh, verse 28 says, Though, then you have those able to help others. Well, this is uh, what's called the gift of service or the gift of serving. Paul says the same thing in chapter 12, verse 7. It says this way, if a man's gift is serving, let him serve. Now in Romans, the Greek word is diakonia. We get deacon from it, which means serve. Uh, someone who serves. But I believe it's the exact same gift that Paul's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. But here's a different word, and this is the only time this word is used in the New Testament as the noun form. It means to take hold of something or to uh, take hold of it so you can give it support and keep it from falling down. The ability to help and assist someone in difficulty. That's what the word is. Someone who has a gift who reaches out and helps someone from falling down. They grab them so they won't fall. That's the essence of this word. Laying hold of somebody's burden and lifting it up so um, they'll stand. They'll make it to the end. You know, God has given some of us, in fact, I think this might be the most common gift that there is in the church, a gift where somebody assists other people. They use their resources, spiritual and physical, so that others who don't have something that they need, you just get, get in there and share so that you can assist them. 
The verb form of this word is um, uh, same root, but it's a verb form that's used in Luke 154 where Mary was found out she is pregnant, so she starts praising the Lord, and she says, he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. Same word. He helped them. Acts 20 to 35, Paul says, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. He worked with his hands. He didn't siphon off the money out of the church. He went and worked. Why? So he could help people who had needs. He was assisting. He was serving. That was his point. He says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 2, those who have, talking about slaves, those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. The tendency would be, well, my master's a Christian, so I don't have to work as hard for him. He's going to forgive me anyway. Easier to get forgiveness than permission, that kind of a thing. No. Don't show less respect for them. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit, there's the word benefit, those who are helped, the master that you have, the one who is benefit, the one who is blessed by your work, because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. You serve. You work. You find something to do and you work with it. That's what the gift of help is. That's what the gift of service is. Uh, now, this is not in the Greek. This is in the Old Testament, but this happened with Moses. He was all stressed out because Israel was coming to him with all these complaints and he was having to judge every, every case. So God uh, sent him some people to help. Number 11, 17, it says, I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take from the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them, these other elders who came. They will help you carry the burden of the people so you will not have to carry it alone. They're going to come and help you. They're going to come and minister with you. They're going to come and serve you so you don't have to deal with that burden all the time, Moses. Someone who has the gift of service, someone who has the gift of helps, that's the way they think. God has put it in you, the special ability, the special desire, the special understanding that, that people out there, that the church needs help, the church needs ministry, and you just pitch in and do it. You like to do it even. Paul writes to Timothy about the widows that are on the list. No widow is to be on the list for, for help, for help from the church. He says, uh, unless she's got these qualifications, is she, and it's well known for her good deeds, uh, if the widow is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, and here's this word, helping, helping those who are in trouble. And that's not the same Greek word, but it's the same idea. It means to aid. She's aiding people. She's helping people in need, helping people who are in trouble, helping people who need a hand so they won't fall over. That's what this, the widows do, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. Acts chapter 9, there was a lady named uh, Tabitha, verse 36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated as Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. She had the gift of helps. She had the gifts of service. She was always helping the poor, always assisting them, always lifting them up, finding what their burden is and lifting it from them, giving it, doing a kind deed, giving alms. I'll give you one more. I love this one. I, th I think I like this one, one of the best verses in the whole Bible. You know, Jesus was on a ministry. He was out... Uh, roaming the countryside, going from town to town, preaching in their synagogues. He had his 12 disciples with him, and there were some other people who followed too. It wasn't just him and the 12. There was a whole crowd of people who followed around with him. And it says in Luke 8, 3, Mary Magdalene, she was one of them. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, she was one of them. Susanna and many others. I love this. These women were helping. This is the Greek, Greek diakonia, serving. These women were serving to support them out of their own means. Now here's Jesus and his disciples doing their work. Jesus is healing people, preaching, all kinds of stuff going on. And here are these women following along with them, supporting them. And I always like to say, they're probably saying, Peter, you need to change your clothes. Here's some clean clothes. You go over there behind that tree, change these. Stuff like that. Helping. 
You got a, a bunch of men walking around, you need help. They need to eat. Lunch, time for lunch, that kind of thing. They were serving. They were serving. It's a gift. It's a spiritual gift. God has given some of us, some of you, the special ability to see a need that needs to be done, a work that needs to be done, something that needs to happen in the church. God has given you this, these eyes where you can see that. And then he gave you this desire to go, someone's need to get over there and get that done. And then you go over there and you do it. Just a gift, a gift to say, that needs to be done, I'm going to go over there and do it. That's a spiritual gift. It could be a, a, any kind of helping hand that someone needs. I know one will be today setting up tables and vacuuming the floor when we're through with our fellowship luncheon. That'll be a need that someone's going to get. Hey, I can't wait. Where are the vacuum cleaners? And putting the chairs back. Hey, someone needs to help put those chairs back. That's my gift. I'm going to do it. Could be all kind of ministry tasks. Someone needs a ride to church. You find out about it. someone needs a ride to church. You go pick them up. Serve. Help. Why? So that person can come to church. They don't have a way to get here. Serving. Helping. This is a very important gift to the church. I'm serious. Very important. It's not showy. It's not flashy. You don't get to get up here and talk. Often you go unappreciated. No one even notices that you did anything. But the, I'll tell you, the church would fall apart. It wouldn't last very long if the people who had the gift of service didn't come and serve and didn't use their gifts to build up the body of Christ. That's a massively important need, an important gift that God has given us. We would not last long and would not function well if he didn't give us this gift. That's the spiritual gift of helps. Paul says that's an important gift here. That's in his list. He also says in verse 28, the second gift that uh, we haven't looked at yet, those with the gifts of administration. The word administration uh, just means to set a course or to steer or guide or pilot a ship, to guide the ship, govern. That's what it means. It's the same word used in uh, Acts 27, 11. The centurion, instead of listening to Paul, what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. I mean, the guy who's steering the ship, the centurion said, let's listen to what he says. He's steering the ship. He's administrating where that ship goes. That's what this means. This is basically the same thing as the gift of leadership. It's not the same word, but I believe it means the same thing. Paul says in Romans 12, 8, if it's leadership, if it's managing, that's what the word there means, to manage, then let him govern diligently with eagerness and haste. Make it happen. So this is a gift that God has given by grace to the church with people who have this special ability, special skill, special grace, special um, gift, where they uh, make wise decisions regularly, motivate people to get things done, mobilize people to get things done, direct others toward the objective of getting things done, able to manage the work and get uh, some work done. They just have this ability to administrate the work, to make sure the work gets done, to motivate the troops so that the troops go take the hill. That's what a leader is. That's what the gift of administration is. People who have that gift, that's given by the Spirit of God. It's for the church. Gift of leadership. First Timothy uh, 5, 17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church, I think he's talking about the people who have that gift, manage or rule the leader the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor especially those whose work is preaching and teaching the writer of hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 says remember your leaders who spoke the word of god to you consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith these are men in the church in terms of church leadership who have the gift of administration. They lead. 
That's why they're called leaders. They manage. They keep the affairs in order. They motivate the people to get things done. Gift of administration. And we need, the church needs this gift. We need administrators in the church. Now I'm just going to chase a rabbit for a second. This doesn't necessarily mean church leadership. Just because you have the gift of administration doesn't make you the pastor. It doesn't make you an elder. God may have given this gift to anybody. Doesn't necessarily mean church leadership, but it does mean organizing and managing a ministry task or an event. You're, you're given some kind of in charge of something and you work it and make it happen. You gather people to get them to do it with you. It's a gift. It's an administrative gift. And God gives it to the people in the church. So Paul says uh, you have those with the gifts of helps, those who are able to help others, those who have the gift of service, and you have those who are administrations, who have administrative gifts, talent, skills, by the Holy Spirit, by grace alone, who can administrate and lead a church and lead all kinds of ministry tasks and functions. Those are the two gifts that Paul lists there that are not listed before in 1 Corinthians. But I want to do something uh, that I wouldn't normally do. I want to skip over a little bit and look at some of the other texts in the Scripture in the New Testament where Paul mentions spiritual gifts and just briefly define or briefly explain what the other gifts are because I don't want to... We're talking about spiritual gifts, and you go, uh, spiritual gifts? Well, what are the spiritual gifts? What's my spiritual gift? And all I got here is uh, tongues and interpretation of tongues. Oh, yeah, and administration. Tongues and interpretation of tongues, healing, and oh yeah, uh, service. Is that all? Well, I want to read some of the other ones and highlight them briefly, and then we'll pick back up in 1 Corinthians 12 again. So bear with me as I chase a rabbit, okay? All right. Paul mentions in Ephesians 4, because we already looked at apostles and prophets and pastor teachers last week, he also mentions here in chapter 4, uh, verse 11, it was he who gave some to be evangelists. Evangelist is a gift. Evangelist, the gift of evangelism or the gift of someone who uh, is an evangelist is a spiritual gift that he's given to the church. And an evangelist is a gift uh, of somebody who finds himself able to speak the gospel clearly to people in such a way that a lot of times when an evangelist speaks the gospel, a lot of people, or at least a, a percentage of these people, more than the rest of us, actually come to Christ and believe. Now, I know that's not foolproof because you can share the gospel to a bunch of dead people and they're not listening unless the Spirit opens their eyes. The Spirit wakes them up from their deadness and gives them life. But God gives this gift of some people who share the gospel easily, um, more clearly, more persuasively than other believers. Now, the, we all should be evangelizing. We all should be sharing the good news to people around us who are lost. All of us should be. But God has given a gift to some men who just are good at it. It's a gift. It's a gift of boldness. It's a gift of just the words come out in a good way. When there's arguments going on, they figure that stuff out too. Like watching Ray Comfort videos. Anyone ever watch any of that? It's like, man, that dude's an evangelist. That's his gift. I wish I could do that. Go out on the street and strike up a conversation with a dude with a blue mohawk. But they have a burden for lost souls. They feel passionately about people around them. And they, they, it's like you can't go to the mall and enjoy shopping without seeing all the people around you who are lost and are going to be judged eternally in hell forever if they don't believe in Jesus and it just drives them nuts. It's like someone's got to get the gospel to them. That's someone who has the gift of evangelism. They have this gift. God gave them a gift. Now that should be every one of us has that same passion, but God has given a gift of an evangelist to see people as lost and want to get the gospel to them. And so they learn as many ways and methods and whatever they can so they can share Christ with as many people as they can. 
That's the gift of evangelists. Paul now, I'm going to go to Paul again in Romans 12 and look at some of the things on that list. Uh, verses 7 through 8. If it is serving, let him serve. We looked at that one a while ago. If it is teaching, let him teach. We looked at that last week and reviewed it again a while ago. Then he says, if it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, we looked at that one just now, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. The serving, the gift of help. We looked at that. Ministering to the needs of others so they won't fall down. Teaching, we looked at that. That's someone who can teach the, the word of God effectively. But then he says encouraging. Let me just briefly go through this. Encouraging is from the Greek word, uh, the same Greek word talks about the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. That's what the word means, to call alongside some, uh, someone. To come alongside, to aid them, to appeal to them, to urge them to exhort them, to encourage and implore them. Someone who has the gift of encouragement has been empowered by the Holy Spirit, a special gift, a special gift to come along someone and maybe uh, be good with advice. You know, we, no one wants to hear advice from someone else, but someone who has the gift of encouragement has a good way of giving good advice. Pleading with someone, begging someone to get their act together, encouraging someone, warning someone, strengthening them, comforting them, persuading them to turn from a sin. You know, yeah, someone who has the gift of encouragement sees someone struggling with sin, they have this gift that makes it easier for them to go up and persuade them and talk to them about it and say, stop that bad habit. Quit dabbling with that regular temptation that you're dealing with. And then keep up the good behavior. Once you overcome that sin and you stop, then keep it going. Someone with the gift of encouragement does that. They're always encouraging. Coming alongside a brother who's struggling. Coming alongside of another brother who's grieving, maybe. Discouraged. Is it just me or is sometimes trying to live a Christian life discouraging? And you're anxious? You're fearful, you doubt, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Oh, that's just me. I know that's just me. Someone who has the gift of encouragement will come up and say, yeah, we're going to make it. You're going to make it. You hang on. You live by faith. We live by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins to take them all away. You hang on to that truth. You cling to that truth. Next thing you know, you're clinging to that truth. Why? Because someone who had the gift of encouragement came alongside of you and helped you. Helped you keep going in the faith. Helped you, help you keep looking to Jesus for strength. Helping you to keep uh, whatever that burden is that you're carrying, they just encourage you to keep going. That's a spiritual gift that God has given to the church. Uh, another one, Romans uh, 7, uh, Romans 12, verse 8 says, if it's contributing to the needs of others, well, that's the gift of giving. There are some people who have a gift by the Holy Spirit, it's all of grace, and it's all of his power who just gives. I think dominantly, majorly, this means sharing your financial resources to meet whatever financial need someone might have or the church might have, or something. It's a gift of giving money. It's a gift of giving money to whatever the need might be. You use your money to give. Well, some people who have that gift. Now, you could go on and on about it. I, really, you could. I think a lot of times people who have the gift of giving, now this isn't foolproof, but people who have the gift of giving, God has often made that person also have a gift of making money. They touch something that goes gold. Or they start a business and it thrives. Or they got, somehow, they've just got it. God has blessed them and they give. There in Romans 12, contributing to the needs of others. Let him give generously. 
Uh, we looked at leadership a while ago. If it's leadership, let him govern, let him govern diligently. But then I want to look at this one. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. This is a much, much needed gift in the church. This is not a, a low gift. This is not a small gift. This is not a gift that you sort of shrug off to the side and go, man, I, um, that's, not the, that's not the one where the hand says to the foot uh, or the eye says to the hand, I don't need you. No, if you have the gift of mercy, we need you. This is a much needed gift. This is a gift of demonstrating sympathy for someone else who, again, someone else has need. Someone who has a big need to be comforted with. A big need to be strengthened. Usually with things like illness or some kind of trouble in their life, some kind of suffering in their life, some kind of down and outer situation in their life is going on. And it happens to any of us. It could happen to any of us. But someone with the gift of mercy would come along and see that need and feel sympathy for it. They would start off that way. They would feel sympathy. They would feel the same anxiety or the same hurt that you feel. And they're longing to help you not feel that way anymore. Mercy, the gift of mercy gives someone the special sensitivity to other people's suffering and sorrow. Me, I see you hurting and I'm going, yeah, life is pain, get over it. Someone with the gift of mercy never says that. They're like, oh, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a gift. Now, like I said about evangelism, Jesus said, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Mercy is what God desires all of us to be like. So the first reaction should never be, get over it, life is pain. It should always be, oh, man. I'm sorry you're hurting like that. I'm sorry you're having this trouble, this difficulty in your life. And it might even be your fault, but the person with the gift of mercy wants to help. They feel that pain. They see someone in distress and they especially notice it. Everybody else doesn't even see it. And you, and you want to help alleviate whatever affliction they're struggling with. That's what the gift of mercy is. I'm telling you, a church that doesn't have people with that gift isn't going to make it. Because, man, we're always judging everybody else. No one's as good as me. No one, yeah, I always judge you by what you do that I don't do. I'm good at avoiding that problem, but you're not, so I'm going to judge you. Someone with the gift of mercy doesn't do that. And God gives people in this church this gift, it's a spiritual gift. If you got it, I want it. Come hang out with me. I'm having a rough day. Actually, yesterday was a rough day. Today's better. But I needed you yesterday. <laughs> so that's what I got. Maybe uh, meals for the sick, um, counseling, someone who's depressed. Being merciful, just being a merciful soul. You know how much that helps God's people? Well, let me skip back to 1 Corinthians 12, okay? That's all I'm going to say about Romans 12 and Ephesians 4. Uh, that'll be our study of the spiritual gifts, at least the ones that are listed that I looked at so far in those two texts. I want to go back to chapter 1, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians, and then deal with the last one that Paul mentions. Then, lastly, last of this list of important gifts, this is one of the ones that everyone's hyped out about. Everyone is, is a rabid about. We've got to have this one. This is the one. Lastly, last in the list is this one gift. They're all excited about showing off their spirituality with this gift. And Paul says, and lastly, verse 28, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. When we looked at this one a few weeks ago too, it's tongues, the gift of tongues is the ability to speak fluently in a real human, ethnic, geographical, national language that you haven't ever studied before. You never heard it, you didn't know how to speak it, and now all of a sudden you can speak this language fluently. That's the gift of tongues. Not, not gibberish, not ecstatic uh, 
meaningless syllables mashed together. Not blah, 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 blah. That's not it. That's not tongues. Tongues is being able to speak plainly and clearly, fluently in a real human language. Paul puts it last. Here, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, the fourth uh, miracles, fifth healings, six. Um, what was six? Helps, seventh administration, and now tongues. And that's the point. This is the point. Those who practice tongues, why do people who practice tongues want to make it so important? And Paul puts it last in the list. Why is tongues all of a sudden? And it was that way in Corinth. It's that way nowadays with the charismatic movement. Tongues, 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 tongues. That's all you hear about. Why is that so important to them when Paul makes it last in the list? I think the Corinthians were just like the modern charismatics. They emphasize tongues, and yet Paul makes it last. Now, I will say this. When we get to chapter 14, which we will get there one day, Tongues is a very important gift. Tongues is a spiritual gift and an important spiritual gift. I'm not going to minimize it. I'm not going to put it down. I'm not going to uh, try to make, uh, explain it away. It's a very important gift in the church. And we will look at it when we get to chapter 14. But it's not as important as the Corinthians are making it out to be. And I think that's where Paul puts it last in this list. That's not as big a deal as you think it is. So Paul gives us one more comment to show you. You Corinthians think tongues is everything. You charismatics and Pentecostals think tongues, think tongues is everything, but it's not what you think. He says, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now, these are rhetorical questions. Paul's using a, um, an argument. And the answer to all those questions is obviously and emphatically no. Not all are apostles. There weren't but a few apostles, period. In the whole church ever, in the whole church of the entire apostolic era, there, what did we say, 15, 20 of them maybe that we could name? We knew there were the 12 and then there were some other ones. No, not all, not all are apostles, not all are prophets, not all are teachers, not all work miracles, not all have gifts of healing, not all speak in tongues, not all of them interpret. And the point is, Paul's point is that all believers have not been gifted with the same gift. All the believers in the church, in the local church and in the universal church, all the believers don't have all these gifts. That was never God's intention or design for spiritual gifts. He was never intended for everybody to have all the gifts. Not, not anyone. Not anyone in the believer has all these gifts. This one verse by itself should be enough to convince the Pentecostals that tongues cannot be the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit for all believers. This one verse, do all speak in tongues? No. Well, if all don't speak in tongues, and that's the obvious answer, then baptism of the Holy Spirit can't, the evidence of speaking in tongues, the, the speaking in tongues cannot be the evidence of being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because then all believers would speak in tongues if they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. And the text says we are. That one verse, that cannot be what baptism of the Holy Spirit means. Because all the believers don't have all the gifts. That's why. So just take the gift that the Holy Spirit has given you, and he has given you a gift. He's given each one of us, all of us, everyone who is a believer, everyone who trusts in Jesus, everyone who has come to faith in him and have been baptized by the Spirit into Christ and into uh, identity with the body of Christ, the church, the local church, us. Every one of us has been given a spiritual gift to use to benefit and bless each other and to grow each other, to help each other be more mature, godly Christians. Every one of us. So whatever gift you have been given, and serve the body of Christ with it. Serve. Use that gift to serve. 
Use that gift to bless each other. Use that gift to bless all the rest of us. Whatever that gift is. Hey, and I would say, I've said this before, even if you don't have the gift, you still have to serve. Even if you don't have the gift of uh, vacuuming floors, the floors are going to be nasty if you don't vacuum. You have to serve, whatever the gift is. And then Paul concludes um, this section, this first section, this first talk, talk about uh, gifts of the Spirit with this. Verse 31 says, But eagerly desire the greater gifts. This is an interesting line, and I'm going to try to teach it right. I, I, it will be right because I'm teaching it. Y'all know that. We'll see. First, the word desire, eagerly desire, is the Greek word that means zealous. Having an active interest in something like you really, really are into it. You are digging it. This is your thing. I want that. I want that. You have enthusiasm and passion for something. The word literally means also, it's translated covet. It means to covet. It means I want that. That's what the word desire means. To eagerly and earnestly strive for something. And when I say covet or these other terms, I mean in a good way, not in a bad way. It's not like you're coveting something that you shouldn't have. This is like coveting something that's good. You want something that's good for you, so you really want it. You really eagerly desire it. You are enthusiastic about it and passionate about it. And by greater gifts, he means things like the showy gifts, the apostles, the prophecy, the teaching. So you, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. Eagerly desire the apostleship or the, uh, the prophecy or the teaching. And I know those are the greater gifts because he said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues. So if you're speaking in tongues, eagerly desire better that you would prophesy. And he will say that again too. Now here's where I... I'm puzzled by this verse because all the translations, pretty much all the translations, all of them, have translated this phrase as a command, which in the Greek is called an imperative move, which means a command. You have to do this. It's imperative that you do this. That's the, the, the text in the Greek language for that verb. All the translations translate this in an imperative mood Greek. So, Eagerly desire means it's a command for you to eagerly desire the greater gifts. But this is why this puzzles me. Uh, because, and y'all try to bear with me if I'm trying not to get wacko. How can Paul be telling the Corinthians to eagerly desire the greater gifts when the gifts that you have have nothing to do with you? We looked at this. The Spirit gives the gifts how he wants to give them. The Spirit is the one who determines who gets what gift and in what measure they get it. The Spirit is the one that determines and arranges. God arranged how the gifts are supposed to be laid out in the church. How do you tell the Corinthians to eagerly desire something when it has nothing to do with you at all? It doesn't matter what I want. It doesn't matter if I want to be a prophet. It doesn't matter what I want to be in terms of my spiritual gift. It's only the gift that God has given me is the gift that I have. How can you say eagerly desire the greater gifts when it has nothing to do with you? How can I desire to be a prophet if God didn't determine for me to be a prophet? Right? Am I, am I off base? I mean, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that way. So I honestly don't understand how uh, this can or even should be a command to eagerly desire the greater gifts. How can you command someone to eagerly desire greater gifts when it has nothing to do with what you want at all? Yeah, I'm going to be a prophet. Yeah, I'm going to be an apostle. How are you going to be an apostle? Because that's what I want. I covet that. So... It perplexes me that that's even a command. I'm just being honest. That perplexes me. And it bothers me a little bit too. Because I don't know how to teach it to you. I don't know how to preach it. I don't know how to teach that God arranges your gift how he wants you to have it. 
and then tell you whatever your primary service that you have that God gave you and then tell you uh, you should desire one better than what you have. How do I teach that? See, it bothers me. I'm just being honest with you. That bothers me. I don't know how to teach that. Now, I will say this. Paul used the exact same form, the present tense imperative verb in 14 verse 1. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. So, I'm a little bit perplexed today, y'all. But it is interesting to me that in the Greek text, the way the Greek language works, it's not this way for every single verb, but you, you, they have different modes or different moods for verbs, like a, a, a imperative means a command or an indicative means just telling you what's happening. But the, the verb form for the imperative in the Greek is identical to the form for the indicative mood. Instead of saying eagerly desire greater gifts as a command, it could just be saying you are desiring the greater gifts. It, it literally could be translated that correctly. You're desiring the greater gifts. And by the way, that's exactly what I think Paul's meaning here. I think all the translations have translated it incorrectly by making it an imperative when it should be an indicative. He should just say, you are eagerly desiring the greater gifts. That's what he's saying. It makes much more sense to me than it does a command. You know why it makes more sense to me than it should be a command? Because that's exactly what the Corinthians were doing. That's what they were like. That church was messed up in all kinds of categories, in all kinds of ways. Sure, I want, watch this, I'm going to start speaking in tongues. Watch this, I'm going to be a prophet. They were desiring, they were coveting these greater gifts better, these better gifts because they were more attractive to them and that would make them uh, be able to show off and boast about the, how spiritual they were because they had a gift that was showy and impressive and out there. That's exactly what the Corinthians were like and I believe that's exactly what the Corinthians were doing concerning spiritual gifts. That's why Paul writes this whole chapter. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. You guys have a problem with spiritual gifts. All you want to do is use them to show off your spiritual superiority over everyone else. That fits the context of the whole letter, by the way, too. Not just spiritual gifts. These Corinthians were selfish, puffed up, fleshly, arrogant church. on everything why not gifts not not it not I'm commanding you to eagerly desire the greater gifts I'm telling you what your problem is you guys are eagerly desiring the greater gifts not the one you have not the one that God gave you but you want something that'll show you off as being somebody superior so I believe that's how it should be translated. You are eagerly desiring the greater gifts. That's, that's going to be my translation. Because I don't even know how to preach the other interpretation or the other translation. I don't know how to preach it. I don't know how to teach you what it means to eagerly desire a spiritual gift that you're not even supposed to have because the Spirit didn't give it to you. Sorry. What does it mean to eagerly desire greater gifts as a command? What does that even mean? Unless, of course, I'll give you a, a, what I think might be, could be maybe an interpretation for that. Unless he's saying something like, you know, tongues is the least important of the gifts on this list. Tongues is last. Don't let tongues be your goal. If you're going to desire gifts that are showy, don't let it at least be tongues. That's the lowest one on the gift on the list. Don't let that be it. Be something better than that. Maybe the, maybe something like that. Seek something better than that. Seek something. Desire something that's better than tongues. Maybe. I just threw that out there. But I still think it means. You guys are desiring the greater gifts. You guys are desiring the showy gifts. You guys are desiring the ones that will make you look fancy and cool. 
But you know what, Corinthians? I'm going to give you, a, I'm going I'm to show you something, Corinthians. Do you really care about the ministry that you have in the local church as far as using your spiritual gifts to benefit and bless and promote and blossom and make the church thrive? Do you even really care about that? I know spiritual gifts are important, and you all have one. You, you're not liking any gift. The Corinthian church had them. But do you really care that those gifts are used for the glory of God so that God is honored and glorified and the church is built up by the gift that you have? Does that even matter to you? For the church's well-being? Do you really want what's the best thing for the church concerning your gifts? Well, then Paul says in verse 31, and now I will show you the most excellent way. And this is where Paul is going next. He's going to show us something. He's going to draw our attention to something. He's going to point out something. I want to point out something to you, Corinthians. I want to point out something to you, South Strand. Something is more excellent than any of the gifts. Something that is the most excellent thing you can have, the most excellent thing you can do. Using any of the gifts you have, they, they, they're small in comparison to this one thing. I want to show you the most excellent way. I want to point out to you and bring to your attention the most excellent way. I love this word, excellent. It's a Greek word, hooper, hooper, bole. You got our English word hyperbole from it, which means a super extreme exaggeration. But the word literally means extreme. The word means Extraordinary, the word means supreme, overabundant, superlative, far more greater degree. That's what the word means. The most excellent path, the most excellent road, the most excellent way. And this is what the Corinthians were sorely lacking in. And this is what they needed. And this is what we need. South Strand needs where Paul's going with this. More than anything else, the most excellent way. I'm glad you got spiritual gifts. I hope you use your spiritual gifts today to bless all the rest of us. That is so important, so necessary, so needed. But I want to show you, Paul says, the most excellent way. You need this more than you need all that. And if you have this most excellent way, it's going to work out. And it's in chapter 13, which we'll start next week, and that's love. Because y'all know the chapter, love chapter. I have to show you the most excellent way, love, the way of love. Way more than your gifts. Let's pray. Father God, I am grateful uh, that you've been kind to me to let me come and speak your word today. Lord, I ask that you will uh, use it, use this message to pour out grace into our hearts and our lives. Give us a desire to use our gifts to serve and bless and minister to each other, whatever they are, whichever one we talked about in the last few weeks and today. But Lord, I pray that you will uh, help us to understand where our gifts fit in, and how we're supposed to use them for Jesus' glory. And as we look at next time, Lord, loving each other, uh, using our gifts in love, help us be that. Father God, if there's anyone who does not know Jesus Christ as the Lord, I pray today that you will uh, draw them to him, you will open their eyes and bring them into fellowship with your son. They will uh, be saved and have eternal life. Do that for us, I pray. And glorify Jesus more than anything. It's in his name I pray it. Amen.